Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Hey everybody, I'm Bruce Broussard. No, I'm not Bruce Broussard. I'm Donnie Adair, <laughs> guest host this week again for Bruce Broussard, who's going to be back with you next week. But in the meantime, he's asked me to come, and I've got a great opportunity today. We're having a legislative update, and I have as my guest the representative from District 43, Lou Frederick. Lou, thank you, thank you for much, spending some time with us uh, today. We have an hour, which seems like a lot of time, but there's a lot going on. <laughs> there's a lot and going on. And so we're, I want us to just have a, a conversation well, thank you. about the legislature and what's been going on and, and about the current session and what you project from the, uh, for the future. Sure. Um, first of all, let's just acquaint people with you as a person. Mm. Some people may not know who you are or your background, so tell us. Uh, a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, welcome to District 43, because that's where we're filming this that's right now. Right. Uh, and uh, and I have actually been in Portland since January 19th, 1974. Okay. That's when I arrived, about three o'clock in the afternoon. All right. And fell in love with Portland back then. And I've been lucky enough to do a lot of things here, uh, everything from teaching to um, um, working as a, uh, a, a television reporter, radio reporter, and also doing a lot of work with. Um, with the Portland Schools, I was the Director of Public Information for the Portland Schools, uh, and I have now been in, uh, in the uh, le uh, legislature since 2009. I was, uh, in, I was appointed uh, in 2009, and I've run for re-election, and been re-elected three times, so I want to thank the, the folks in District 43 for re-electing me. I have a number of uh, things that I've been able to do and work on. Uh, my interests are pretty broad. Uh, my degrees in theater, mm -hmm. uh, but it's essentially a, uh, a triple minor in biology and political science and psychology. So I've gotten a chance. I'm I'm curious about a lot of things, okay. and uh, that helps in the legislature because we have a lot of different things going on. Well, you're well educated. You're well prepared. You've done a lot in the community. And it's kind of interesting, you know, 25 years ago, you interviewed me. You were the reporter yeah. interviewing me. And so now here we are, there 25 we are. years later, we're revol roles are reversed. We're we still go. trying to do good for the community. So. Well, that's the key. I think for me, it's been, uh, it's been a lifetime of, uh, so far of, of making sure that I, the, the, the goal I have is to make things better for the people around me. Okay. Uh, I was lucky enough to grow up during the civil rights era and be in the middle of the civil rights um, uh, issues. Uh, in Atlanta, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, mm -hmm. Alabama, Mississippi, to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I got a chance to see some things then and talk with people. All the, all the civil rights icons you can pretty much imagine, I got mm -hmm. a chance to meet and, work and march with and walk with uh, as a kid. Uh, for the most part, and I desegregated my high school in Atlanta. So oh, great, I've great. been through a, a few things, but the idea for me is to make things better uh, for the people around me, and that's my goal within my, my job as a legislator. Now, you're on three committees at the present right. time. Tell us what committees you're on in the legislature. Well, I'm on the uh, uh, Ways and Means Joint Committee on Information Technology. Okay. I'm on the Agriculture. So this would be a joint Subcommittee, subcommittee of the House of Representatives and the Oregon State Senate and the Oregon State Senate. Okay. Yes, there are there. I believe there are six of us on that on that, uh, on that subcommittee. Each body? Three, three from each three body. From yeah. Okay. And uh, and so we have a joint committee on information man, information technology, okay. and we're looking at the the information technology for the various agencies and and how they're doing and how they're not doing mm -hmm. and and how they're adjusting to changes that, mm -hmm. we're, that we need to, that everyone needs to struggle with. Okay. Um, that's one. I'm on the Agriculture and Natural Resources Committee, okay. which I get a kick out of because it's not expected for someone from the Portland area to be mm -hmm. really part of that committee. Uh, but I was lucky enough as a reporter to travel the rest of the state. Mm -hmm. So I've been in all 36 counties. Uh, I did lots of stories. I was a science reporter okay. for many years. Okay. Uh, so I, I got a chance to go and do stories on 
on uh, on what was going on with uh, natural resources and uh, as well as some of the scientific issues and you know the uh, things that were going on with geothermal uh, work and with the spotted owl and with all the all the different um, agricultural uh, issues around the state. So I'm getting a kick well, out of that. Well, first in those. Well, and I also I was lucky enough uh, when I was uh, in the in the 70s I got a chance to be a, a ranch hand on a ranch in okay. Nebraska, and uh, and also found out when I was very early on um, what it was like to to pick cotton in Mississippi and okay. realize that that was something I was not planning on doing with All my right. life. So I've, I've, I've had that kind of connection. And then I've, I'm also uh, the vice chair of the education committee, which okay. is, um, it's the policy committee, uh, mm -hmm. which is different than the, the ways and means committee, which does a lot of the money. We look at the issues and the policies that we might institute. Right. And then the uh, ways and means committee decides whether we're going to pay for them or not. But okay. uh, right. uh, we are looking at a lot of different things. So I, that's what I'm getting a chance to be on, uh, as well as uh, being members of uh, several different sort of internal caucuses. One is I'm on the mental health caucus okay. and I'm on the uh, sportsman's caucus uh -huh. as well. And we're going to talk about that right. toward the end a little, in a little bit more depth. Sure. Depth. I'm, I'm a sportsman to my heart, so yeah, you I know, know I want to probe that a little bit Good. more. Good. Yeah. So um, in your first two sessions yeah. as a state representative and now up to this point, um, talk about uh, your major accomplishments? Well, I was, I was um, actually helped in my first session because my first session was a special session in 2010. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I got a chance uh, that the treasurer at the time uh, asked me to, to bring it forward a bill. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And so I can say that my first bill that I brought forward uh, brought the, the state $2 billion. Now, okay. not, not bad. It mm -hmm. was the Build America Bonds bill, which was basically using the money from the American Recovery Act and making sure that we had that money here in the state. We had some wording that needed to be changed mm -hmm. so that we could get the money. Receive so I, um, I, I, was, I was asked to do that, and, and, I, and I, that, felt, that felt good. Um, but um, so I, I can say I was very successful in my first <laughs> session because we were only allowed two bills and that was one of those and mine passed unanimously and, and went on to the signature from uh, Governor Kulinguski at the time. Uh, but the next two sessions, I've done a number of things um, and worked and been pretty effective. I've got a, uh, those two sessions, I, I probably had a 45 percent uh, rate of success with my bills, okay. and they were a uh, wide range of bills. Uh, they were things that involved um, brownfields and and the cleanup of brownfields, okay. trying to get some things done there. Uh, they also involved some education issues and a number of other issues on foreclosure, uh, how we deal with foreclosure issues in, mm -hmm. in this in the city and the state. I also brought forward bills dealing with um, police accountability mm -hmm. uh, issues. And some of those, although they didn't pass necessarily, they at least got some discussion. Mm -hmm. And in the last year, we've had a lot more national uh, situations, and so people are paying a lot closer attention. And I think we'll see some of those bills pass this session. Okay, okay great. So now you're in the current session, and I kind of wanted to get you to talk about the current environment, noting that we have this big change in administration in the governor's office. Uh, talk about that change from your vantage point. Okay. And, uh, you know, did you, did you think at the beginning of the session that Kitts Harbor would survive these inquiries about the beginning fiance? of the session? Yes, I did. Um, and quite frankly, it hasn't affected me that much. Okay. It hasn't affected a lot of the, the legislators that much because mm -hmm. you have a, a timing that takes place. The governor. Uh, proposes bu a budget in December. Mm -hmm. uh, the the co-chairs, the co-chairs of Ways and Means Committee, uh, look at that budget and determine how they feel about the the budget uh, in January, and we begin the process there. By that time, then the governor's role is uh, bully pulpit and mm -hmm. and talking with people and saying this is what I'm really interested mm -hmm. in, but it's not as um, as direct. Legis to to the le to individual legislators as it might be as as people might believe so mm -hmm. really uh, the whole 
the, the whole situation that we've seen with the change to Governor Brown mm -hmm. hasn't had much of an effect on me or most of the legislators mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the Capitol. What it has had an effect on is at the, administra at the administrative executive level, and they're trying to sort out mm -hmm. who's going to be working on different things and how many of the priorities that Governor Kitzhaber had are going to be the priorities for Governor Brown. We're still, we're still determining that, mm -hmm. still trying to figure that out. Also, though, I would hope that, and it seems uh, the early signals are that Governor Brown is looking at ethics and these kinds of things and how contracting is done and those kinds of things sure. uh, in order to prevent any questions in the future about how the state uh, buys services and, and that kind of thing. She has uh, made it very clear that she's going to be looking at that, but no one should be surprised. I mean, she mm -hmm. was Secretary of State, and that's what the Secretary of State did anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they, she is, she's been doing that uh, kind of work for quite some time, mm -hmm. uh, and she'll just continue it. She's made it very clear that's how she wants to work on things. Okay. Uh, can you forecast any changes in policies or procedures? that you expect from the governor's office? You know, I can't. I just, I don't know. I've known Kate Brown for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, she is, uh, she is uh, tenacious. She mm -hmm. is uh, determined to make a, a change, uh, make, make a change for the state. Mm -hmm. uh, she has been, since I met her as a state legislator, uh, when, when she was a state legislator, um, I've, I've seen her determination to make some changes. But mm -hmm. what she's going to do, uh, she has a background in a number of fields as well. Uh, I anticipate that uh, we'll probably see uh, support uh, from her on a number of the things that are already underway. Mm -hmm. I know, for instance, on Monday she's planning on signing the Motor Voter Bill. Well, I was okay. involved in getting that passed, uh, okay. both um, getting it through the House in the last, excuse me, in the last session and through the House so in this session. That's going to allow people to to register to vote at more places? Is no, that... this is a very simple sort of thing. If you uh, s uh, sign up to get a driver's license, mm -hmm. full driver's license, you have to provide a lot of information mm -hmm. there. Once you have signed up to get a driver's license, you are automatically enrolled as a voter. Okay. And you will get a postcard that will say, do you want to vote? You can, you can refuse to say, I don't want to vote, that's mm -hmm. fine. Or do you, uh, and do you want to join a particular political party? Mm -hmm. But uh, what will happen basically as a result of this is the estimate was we will have 300,000 new voters mm -hmm. on, the, on the rolls as soon as the motor voter bill comes in. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, substantial uh, change. It sounds in, very progressive. It is very progressive and it's, it makes us, with the exception of one aspect uh, of our voting situation, probably the most um, uh, adaptable, the, the most uh, accessible mm -hmm. voting system in the in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing we don't have is we you have to you have to register uh, 20 days before the election. Okay. Uh, because of uh, we, what we what took place surrounding the um, the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh and, right. and, and right. the whole Rajneesh Rajneesh mm -hmm. situation. So that's the only thing. Other states have same day registration. We don't. Right. But you. Uh, but beyond that, we are going to do something uh, rather extraordinary and and when we see people vote it's really an extraordinary thing and I've been trying to do that since I was about eight years old I've been taught walking and talking with people about getting getting people to uh, the ability to vote well, so I, I think it's a good thing I uh, can recall at one of my big Christmas dinners we have one every year that I told the young people that were like between 18 and 24 they couldn't get a plate until they filled out a voter registration card. Thank you, Donnie. I appreciate <laughs> that. Sorry. That's good. That's no, very good. I mean, so this would this when they signed to get their driver's license, they would they, they would have uh, now be enrolled. But no, I, mean, I really, I, the young people particularly, yeah. not just young people, but in particular, young people, eighteen to twenty one, eighteen to twenty five. Not voting. They're not registering. And they're not voting. Well, and so. they're dis and and in some cases, there's been a political strategy to discourage them from voting, mm -hmm. um, which is which I think we break through now. Uh, there's a pol been a political strategy in some states to discourage a lot of people from voting. Yeah. We have all the the voter ID things and the moving um, precincts and all sorts of stuff going on in other parts mm -hmm. of the country. Um, but we do not have that. And, and I've got to tell you, I've got to brag about this, because this is District 43, 10 precincts in District 43. 
eight of those precincts in 2012 had a 90 percent plus voter turnout. Mm. And the two slaggards were at 87 percent. Okay. So uh, we have a we have we can we ha we can do that kind of thing, and people will get out to vote if they have if they if they're asked to, and they are given some sense of how they can do make a difference. And you know, one of the reasons that Kate Brown is so um, so adamant about getting people to vote is she tells the story about the fact that she won her first election by seven votes. Right. So. Everyone knows that that's one of the things you have to you have to really work with. Well, I, I can remember getting on one board. If, uh, I won by one vote. If I hadn't voted for myself, <laughs> <laughs> so voting is I know how important voting is. Well, I'm, I'm glad that we're going to have that, and I'm and I'm glad to see that uh, we're going to have a lot of people getting out to vote. They they won't all be they won't re necessarily register as win one party or another. Mm -hmm. I hope they do, but uh, yeah. uh, that that I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Talk a little bit about, before we get into the House bills, about the Senate. You, the two bodies do have to work together. I noted in looking over some of the bills, there seems to be companion bills in the right. uh, Senate and House well, that well, want to do similar things. Yeah, this is, this is a, um, a strategy on which bill, which, which uh, chamber is going to get the bill out first. Mm -hmm. So I have, a, I have a couple of bills that are co uh, companion bills in the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, that are also in the House, and we're trying to work to see how they might, who might discuss them first, mm -hmm. and and it's a matter of strategy. You okay. you determine, you know, that there's a, a greater chance of this Senate committee saying yes to this bill and passing it along, okay. or a House committee doing that. Uh, how much control can you have of that? How much, how, what what relationship do you have with the chairs of those particular committees? Mm -hmm. So we and uh, and who's going to introduce it? I have a bill, for instance, that deals with student rights, student privacy, uh, mm -hmm. for records privacy. Who has access to, to student records? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and can they uh, change them and, and can they look at them and, uh, and, and determine who, who can use them? Yes. Um, all of these things are part of a bill that I have. But there's a, a companion bill, a very similar bill, in fact, almost exactly the same bill, mm -hmm. in the Senate that has been proposed by the Attorney General's office. Okay. And they are talking about it in different ways, and so we'll see which bill comes first and gets okay. out of the out of the committee first, and then okay. heads over to the other the other side of the the okay. aisle, other side of the uh, the Capitol. Okay, we're going to boil down to some of your specific bills, but what do you feel are the most important issues that the legislature is facing right now? Well, I think that um, we are always going to be facing the issues regarding education, mm -hmm. both funding yes. and policies regarding education. So I think we're going to see that. But the, the funding issue is the one that I'm hearing a lot about. I had a town hall meeting yesterday, uh, and I heard from people about the funding issue. Mm -hmm. uh, folks wanted to know whether we were, what kind of monies the, the state uh, public schools were going to get and what, what they weren't. Um, the we but that's not just K twelve. It's also for early learning. Mm -hmm. uh, how much money is there? What's going to happen with the colleges and the and the community college colleges mm -hmm. and universities and community colleges? So those are that's probably the biggest issue that we'll we'll see a lot of media about. I hope mm -hmm. over the next um, few day few weeks or so. Uh, and then there are policy issues related to education as well. The testing the mm -hmm. the amount of testing is just completely out of out of hand the amount of preparation for testing the cost for that testing all of those things are uh, things that I'm concerned about mm -hmm. and whether in fact the tests are telling us anything yeah. that, that that's another story as well uh, the tests that they're, they're, they're proposing do not tell us very much and they and you they cost much a lot not just for the testing but also in time, time. Uh, as well as preparation you have teachers uh, spending almost a third of their time now on testing on, on, on standardized nationally national testing mm -hmm. that they don't get the information about until after the, the students are out of the, the classroom. So mm -hmm. that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Right. So we're going we're gonna to probably have some significant discussions about that. I would guess that we're probably going to see, obviously, I think we're going to see, I hope, uh, something regarding the uh, police uh, profiling and, and how that affects the different communities around the state, right. not just Portland, but mm -hmm. uh, in Madras and uh, and in Umatilla and mm -hmm. in uh, Klamath Falls and in Medford and Jackson and Coos Bay, uh, uh, Ontario. Um, is the this is a real issue. On arrests and prosecutions and so forth uh, for people of color in those areas, 
similar to what has happened absolutely. in Absolutely. Absolutely. And what you're dealing with is different is a, you know different um, minority communities. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're dealing with a Native American and Latino, in some cases Asian mm -hmm. uh, folks who are who are treated uh, poorly, uh, and the disparity of, of of not even arrest, just pulling people over. Yeah. Um, and that's the issue that, yeah, that harassment, we're, the harassment. Mm -hmm. and uh, and you know and there's a there's an issue we we, we actually heard a little bit about this last week and the week before. Um, of an assumption of guilt before anyone is gets a chance to say anything. You know, right. we are supposed to assume innocence until proven guilty. Right. But um, apparently, in, in many cases, we're dealing with a an assumption of guilt right away uh, when somebody and and you and I and a lot of other folks, uh, I'm sure, know about how that how that works. For me, it's being pulled over once a year. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I was pulled over in front of my house three times, mm -hmm. asked whether I was lost or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but because I live in Irvington, I was uh, unusual to see my face in Irvington. Mm -hmm. that, uh, how was that happening? Well, I had to explain to the fellow, yes, I lived in this house since 1977. So, mm -hmm. yes, I, uh, I, I'm not lost. I know exactly where I am, but I understand why you think it would be unusual for me to be here. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, that's and he didn't arrest me. He didn't charge me with anything. Right. But I get uh, when you get when you get pulled over um, once a year, and you're not sure whether this person is going to be um, pleasant mm -hmm. or not. Uh, it wants to wants to to show somehow control of something. There's a lot of anxiety yeah, there. Uh, well, I, mm -hmm. I, I put it I put it this way: when I when I see blue lights behind me, and I pull over, I ask myself, Am I going to live? Am mm -hmm. I going to die today? Because mm -hmm. I'm just not sure. That's the case. That's how I've had to deal with things. And uh, and frankly, every black man I've ever talked with has said mm -hmm. they've they've ha had that kind well, of an encounter. The, and it extends on out, uh, as you're indicating, around the state, not only to the local residents uh, residents of the state, but you know, I I'm a boater, and you know, you get, you know. Rousted as a boater, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know all your paperwork and all. You know right. you got to have a lot of paperwork to go out and enjoy and do recreation and stuff. I mean, you got to have now licenses to drive a boat. You got to right. have your registration right. just like a car. Yeah. You yeah. need to have some insurance and everything too. Sure. But uh, you know, and then you got to have your fishing licenses and the right tags well, and, and all, all the this. tags. And, and but the the, the parallel. To being stopped in the city yeah. is so similar, you know. He said, "Well, you see my tags on the boat. I right. got current tags and everything, right. you know." And you wonder, is he stopping everybody? Right. And it, there's always that question. And the and the answer is he's not. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the really the, the the data completely for all of that. We mm -hmm. do know that that more. We do know in some of the some of the studies that we have seen that there's disparate stops. Mm -hmm. There that that there's a that there's certainly uh, a greater um, um, the, the people get charged more, mm -hmm. they get uh, harassed more, they get uh, put in court, mm -hmm. they get they get longer sentences, all of these kinds of things related to their eth ethnicity. And that's something that we need to at least speak to. Well, well you know, and it's, again, seeing the, the reports coming out of uh, FBI and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and it's amazing to me. I, I, we were under surveillance one time for four and a half hours while duck hunting, if you can believe that. No, I believe it. And federal officers of the interior right. post just gold badges and all this stuff. It was, it was well, crazy. it is, it, <laughs> it, uh, you, and, you, and the reports this week coming out of Ferguson mm -hmm. uh, indicating that something on the order of, I think they have 22,000 people or, or something living there and 16,000 were officially because they had um, they had traffic tickets or they had other other things, they were officially under under either under surveillance or considered criminals because they were no longer they they hadn't they hadn't paid the right. tickets or things like that. So you're, w you're when you're dealing with something like that, that's just so blatant. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. But what we have in Oregon as a result of um, uh, a good group, the uh, Center for Intercultural Organizing, yeah. um, uh, uh, Casey Casey Jama and uh, and a number of other folks um, went out to um, uh, went out and 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 traveled the state mm -hmm. and talked with people but also had their own encounters mm -hmm. um, in, in places throughout the state as mm -hmm. well and they've come back with those stories and so we'll, we should see something I think come out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Okay. Begin talking about the specific bills that my specific yeah, bills. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the bills that you would want to share with us that you think are most important, or ones that you sponsors or that others have sponsored that you think are the most important for us to to really get through this time. Well, I think we're going to see something with profiling, and I think okay. that I think that was evident from the very beginning of the session, okay. the 2001, 2002, and 2003, the first three bills that were read. Um, by the how in the House of Representatives dealt with profiling. What's the House bill on profiling that you? Well, there those uh, are those are there there are comp those those are three bills that are together. I think three uh, 2000, um, 2001, uh, 2003, uh, and 2000 and 2002. I mean, they're all three of those are going to be. We're going to have some something that's one of uh, the one two or three of those will mm -hmm. come out of uh, out of this session dealing with profiling. And what what do the bills really well they require they they first of all talk about uh defining profiling and okay. and tracking it in okay. some form and then they then they set up a procedure for a complaint procedure if okay. people feel as though they have been uh, treated poorly and and then the question is who then organizes that who then investigates that mm -hmm. those are the th those are the uh, those, mm -hmm. that's the essential part of all three of those bills okay. uh, and then then there's going to be probably a bill on um, on uh, body cameras okay. uh, for police now that's an issue that's not as simple as just let's put a camera on and let's have somebody because you have situations that who turns a camera on, who turns it off, mm -hmm. uh, where is it stored, who has access to right. it, what do you do with confidentiality, confidential uh, discussions, uh, can it be used for face, facial recognition so that can a police officer basically walk through a crowd, mm -hmm. especially a demonstration, and do a facial recognition, you use a program on that. Mm -hmm. All of these issues are the things we're still talking about. Okay. Uh, but I have a bill as well, and I have a, 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 a body camera bill, but I have a bill as well that talks about the ability for uh, to not be accused of interfering with the police officer because you're taking pictures from across the street. Okay. If you get in the middle of, of something and you're, you're right in, in, in the face of somebody, mm -hmm. that's interfering. But right. if you're standing someplace else, you can't go over and say, you know, you're interfering. You're, you're creating a problem for me. I need to, you to take the, put that away mm -hmm. or I'm going to take it from you. That's mm -hmm. not interfering. Um, that's, that's a different thing. So I have a bill on, on that. I have some bills as well dealing with psychological profiling. Uh, not psychological profiling, but psychological testing mm -hmm. and evaluation, regular psychological evaluation uh, of people. So we'll try to see if we can work on that as well. Uh, and I have other bills that are on other issues altogether. The, I mentioned the the uh, student the testing issues. Uh, I want uh, the ability for parents to opt out of the testing and kids if they if they want to, uh, because right now I don't see that see it as necessarily a valid. Well, who program. are some of the other? progressive people like yourself that are co-sponsoring these with you. Yeah, I've got a long list of folks actually okay. and and the education committee and the and other people are there uh, uh, Senator um, uh, uh, Dembro, Senator Shields, um, a number I mean I've got a list I can go down the list of folks who are who are involved uh, uh, representative Kenny Geyer and v Vega Peterson all these folks different people on different issues. I'm doing a number of bills that deal with um, uh, mental health issues. Okay. Um, uh, one of the things that happens when you are discharged, if you are if you are going to a hospital and you've had a mental health uh, crisis mm -hmm. and you're coming out, it's not necess You're not necessarily going to be told if you're a family member how to help that person. Mm -hmm. There's no discharge procedure right now. Right. It depends. Mm -hmm. It really depends on the on the uh, on the, the the program at that particular hospital. In many cases, and I can say from personal experience, mm -hmm. in many cases that that you don't know. Yeah, and we all have those persons. Yeah, and, and you just don't know. So, but if you I've went in... i an right now. Yeah. He's in jail because of his mental health state. Right. And, right. and trying to get that resolved and, and get him back out and all that. It's very difficult. It yeah. is indeed. And, and so, if, but if, they, but if he, you had taken him into the hospital with a broken leg mm -hmm. and they, they got that all set up, they would have told you to have him stay off the leg and and these are the thing this is what he needs to uh -huh. take for for pain medication they would have told you all that mm -hmm. they don't they necessarily do that now and so I've got some bills related to that and uh, and then I've got some bills that are on um, public contracting okay. uh, one of the issues that we that we struggle with right now is that uh, if you get a, a large public contract and you say you're going to uh, include 
my, our subcontractors who are minority women and emerging small business, mm -hmm. no one checks to see whether you're actually including those folks. Right. And if you aren't, if they do find that you aren't, there are no penalties for, for doing that. We need to change that. We need to make it clear that if you are, in fact, going to use minority um, women and emerging small businesses, you're actually using folks who are, in fact, valid, uh, validly uh, set up that way. Uh, and if you're not, don't don't claim that you are. We've had some bad actors who right. have claimed that and managed to get away with it and get further government contracts, which is not appropriate. So those are just some of the things I'm dealing with. Well, we're going to talk more in the, the second half about your specific bills, okay. and we're going to get to that sportsman's uh, Oh, you want to, you, you yes. definitely want to get to that. All yes, right, that do. sounds good. That sounds very good. Um, the, uh, are, we, do, are we taking a break here then? Is that what happens? We're coming up on a break here in just a moment, and okay. I just want to let our audience know I'm Donnie Adair, guest host for Bruce Broussard on Oregon Voters Digest, talking with Representative Lou Frederick, District 43. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Hey everybody, welcome back to Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Donnie Adair, filling in for Bruce Broussard, who will be back next week. And my guest giving us a great legislative up update is State Representative Lou Frederick, and he's uh, elected from District 43, North and Northeast Portland. And Lou, thank you so much. Well, sure, thank you and, for inviting me. The first half hour is very enlightening about okay. the environment in Salem right now, what's going on and, and how the legislature is functioning. And you were beginning to share with us some of the important bills that you see uh, and that you're advocating for down there. So continue talking about those bills. Well, I, and as you mentioned that, and I wanted to make sure that there are, there are several bills that often get, or things that often get um, missed, and they're, they're House resolutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have, um, I have three that I have introduced. Uh, Senator Shields and I think that Michael Dembro have introduced another couple of them that I'm part of. And they, I just want to mention these because it's important for the community. Um, my three bills, or th three resolutions, deal with um, memoriams mm -hmm. for Janice Scroggins. Okay. For Linda Hornbuckle. Oh, my friend. For Obo Addy. Oh, right. All three uh, of them. Uh, the other ones are for um, uh, Christine Poole Jones. Yes. And, uh, and also for um, um, G uh, Geneva mm -hmm. Knowles. Yes. Uh, so we're gonna, we, we will have some presentation on those, and I'm, I'm, I hope to uh, introduce another one uh, di uh, for um, um, uh, Carl Diaz mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but the idea is that we need to 
uh, celebrate those those mm -hmm. folks mm -hmm. at the state level, recognize their contribution to the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. Well, you've certainly uh, chosen some people that we all know and love. I mean, okay. these are people that were close to many people Absolutely. in the community. And as you know, we uh, memorialized uh, Oboe last year, right. and, and of course Janice and Linda right. Hornbuckle, right. Uh, as well as, you know, I went to college with Chris Poole. Oh, know, did you really? At University really of Oregon. Oh. So, you know, we go back yeah. uh, to the 60s, man. Mm -hmm. So. You, it, all of those, Carl Diaz, great people, the Diaz family, wonderful family co contributions to to. Well, this is the this Oregon. is one of the things that that you get to do as a legislator, mm -hmm. um, is to bring forward ideas mm -hmm. and people and uh, and let the rest of the community understand how important they are. Mm -hmm. So those are just, I mean, those are those are the relatively simple resolutions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I I've been in the past been able to do that with Charles Jordan. Yes. Um, with uh, with um, um, a number of other folks as well. So mm -hmm. I, I'm feeling very good about that. Great book uh, on Charles Jordan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. His autobiography. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a great read. I read it in one night. Oh, did you? Yeah. And, and I stayed up all night. Yeah. Night well. And read it. But it was very interesting. Well. I thought I knew him. And uh, I didn't know him as well as I thought. Uh, I, I always uh, admired him for a lot of the things that he did, but I didn't know his background, right. dealing with segregation, all these things was in his background yeah. that I didn't know, that he'd come up out of to be the, the contributor to society that he was. Well, and you know, we had, we had we had one on Harold Williams uh, as yes, well, yes. Uh, last the last session. The, um, one of the things about, uh, I've got to tell you the story, because he, he came over to talk with a group of uh, fifth graders at my house. Who is this? Charles Jordan. Charles Jordan. And you know, he, sort of ducked getting into the, the door because he was so tall and these fifth graders were looking up at this guy going, well, now, um, so did you play basketball? He said, yeah, I played basketball. Did He said, did you go, uh, did you go to the NBA? He said, no, I was, I was uh, asked to go to the NBA mm -hmm. twice and turned them down. And these, mm -hmm. you know, their eyes just, you what? Yeah. Yeah. He said, yeah, this is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And they were, uh, he was, uh, he, he sat in my living room and talked with a group of 12 fifth graders back in the, um, oh, Late uh, early nineties. He was very endearing person, very absolutely uh, inspiring person. Absolutely. Well, and you mentioned Harold Williams. Yes, absolutely. Harold Williams was great too. Yeah. Uh, he was raised on the corner, one block from us. Oh, is that right? Right here in this neighborhood too. So I'm a neighborhood guy. <laughs> oh, you were just on like G Street you. there. Yeah, there. Yeah. I understand. Vancouver and Monroe. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the kind of thing that you get a chance to do as a legislator, mm -hmm. uh, to talk with people. And if you talk with uh, Margaret Carter or Evel Gordley or oh, yeah. Joanne um, um, Hardesty and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and Jim Hill, they will tell you, and, and um, Bob Boyer, they will tell you that these are the kinds of things you get a chance to actually step forward and mm -hmm. do. Uh, and and in, in the House and, and in the Senate, mm -hmm. it makes a big difference there. So, okay. other bills. Other bills. Important. Well, I could go. I mean, I I, I have I have actually have, uh, including the resolutions. Uh, I am I'm uh, one of the uh, chief sponsors of uh, of about forty three mm -hmm. uh, bills, and that's that that's doesn't lot. that's a lot. And I have a staff member, you know, Sue Hagmeyer and um, Amira Streeter are my staff members. And they are struggling to keep up with not only those bills, but also the other bills that come up in the committees. Mm -hmm. Because bills come up in committees that I didn't introduce, but you need to know what's going on with them. So I've gotten a chance to do a few other things that include, as I, I mentioned, some of the uh, the standardized testing issues. Mm -hmm. But um, the I, I have a bill, and I don't know whether where it's going to go, but I'd like to... Um, provide a tax credit for anyone who builds on an old brownfield. Okay. Now the brownfields, you may not, you would have known them as former gas stations and dry cleaners mm -hmm. and battery companies and photography studios mm -hmm. and things like that. Anywhere where there was a contamination mm -hmm. that took place in mechanic shops and, mm -hmm. and things like that. In my district, there are 146. Mm, that's a lot. That's well, it's 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 a lot, but it's also about the same in just about every legislative district. Because are, are people we used not to have, allowed to build on those? Well, now? they can, but they have to clean them up, and so mm -hmm. you, you yeah. they have to know what the chemicals are that are there. They have to they take some time to clean them up. And in many cases, the people who did the the contamination are long gone. Mm -hmm. So trying to find out what was there and how it happened is un unclear. Mm -hmm. The DEQ will go in and take a look at that and, mm -hmm. and, and make a determination, but I'd like to have the next step. I'd like to have encouragement 
of folks to put new jobs on those brownfields. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see a tax, tax credit mm -hmm. for any new jobs created on those brownfields. Those are just some of the things. But I've got another bill that I think is probably more, uh, certainly more controversial in, at times. Mm -hmm. But it's also getting a lot of support, which I'm pleased to see. Uh, we you know we passed the marijuana uh, legislation right. in the last uh, in, in the last election. Well, uh, because of that, there are folks uh, the, the folks will be able to sell, um, possess, um, and grow mm -hmm. marijuana in much, very large quantities. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you go up and down the street, you'll see storefronts that are now going to be dev devoted to medical marijuana and potentially other other storefronts as well. But there are people who are in jail right now who were growing very small amounts or who had possessed very small amounts or traveling with very small amounts. They're in jail. They have, uh, they have records, criminal records as a result of that. I've suggested that those records be expunged if they were not involved in any sort of violent mm -hmm. situation, but they were involved with, with the, the same kinds of things that now would be uh, legal. legal in what well, will be legal in July, mm -hmm. uh, that those, folk, those, those records be expunged because if they are expunged, those folks have a chance for jobs, mm -hmm. for education, for housing that they presently do not have. Right. And so I've asked, if, asked that that take place. We'll see if that works, but I've got to tell you the response to that when I walk into a church mm -hmm. or when I walk into Safeway mm -hmm. uh, is extraordinary. People coming up to me telling me that that's what has held them back mm -hmm. because 15, 20 years ago they were arrested on a marijuana charge. Right. They were. They were had a possession, and it was larger than what was allowed in the state at the time. And they are, they've not been able to get jobs. They've not been able to do a lot of things. They've also, in many cases, <laughs> excuse me, That's okay. uh, in many cases they 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 can't create families. They mm -hmm. aren't able to to be a, a contributing member of the community because they're struggling just to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll we, that mix may have a change there. I hope. I think that's a great idea. I really do, and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, it comes to fruition because well, it doesn't make sense to keep people in jail or keep the record uh, of something that is not no longer illegal. Right, right. And this is the this is the issue that that we're struggling with. So I, I hope we're going to get something through that, mm -hmm. and people are stepping forward. There is a uh, and this is a, a bad. Bad pun, but it's true. It's called the Joint Committee on Marijuana Laws. <laughs> pun intended, <laughs> but, <laughs> but they are meeting regularly. I don't. They may be meeting four days a week, okay. um, but they're re meeting regularly to talk about the the um, what happens with the banking issues, mm -hmm. what happens with uh, making sure that that children are not affected. Mm -hmm. Here's an issue that they have to deal with: hemp and marijuana are from the same species, mm -hmm. but there's a real difference uh, if 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 you get the pollen from if they cross pollinate mm -hmm. uh, they damage the other the other uh, crop mm -hmm. okay. so they've got to figure out how they're going to deal with those those issues as well so they're they're talking about those things and you'll see something coming out of that soon but any forecast on how this whole legalization of marijuana is going to go I mean have you guys been looking at Washington and yep. Colorado oh, and so forth Absolutely. There, there's a lot of discussion on that. And a, the committee is, I'm not sure how many people are on the committee, but the committee is a pretty long, large one. And they are, and it ha includes law enforcement people and mm -hmm. social service folks. And they're, I mean, and, and le the legislators who have those backgrounds. Uh, and they're talking a lot about what's happened in Washington because you don't want to have some of the, you don't want to have a black market that mm -hmm. uh, is not only created but continued that part of this whole idea is to try to avoid that. So, and how what's happened in Colorado? Um, all of those, those, um, those experiences are being part a part of the discussion. Well, the, I think the problem is one that you alluded to with people who have the record of marijuana possession or right. uh, getting arrested or uh, convicted of possession, right. uh, not being able to get employment and all of that. Hey, our, our kids that haven't been arrested but can't pass a drug test still may not get a, well and then a, the drug test um, issue is another you know, thing too yeah, you know and we're going to so. have to deal with that because you, you you know you there's an issue about alcohol a dui mm -hmm. dui um, you know you get well you don't have a test real test for that because marijuana can stay in the system for a lot longer it doesn't right. mean that you're impaired just because it's in the system so uh that's that's part of that's that's going to be part of the discussion anyway as well yeah. 
Well, it's 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 a big issue. Yeah, I know. agree. I agree it's a hard. So as I go th- I mean, as I go through my list, those are just some of the things. You know, one of the one of the things that we have um, uh, a bill that I have as well is we're, t- we're talking about funds. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, if you are arrested and you put in you your 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 money is taken and and placed in in a uh, in in some way, you you often are not given the money back. You're given a credit card back mm-hmm. or a cash. But each time you use the card, you actually uh, are charged with use of the card, so you're not right. getting all of the money back. So one of the one of the issues <laughs> is to make sure that you're getting returned all of the money, all of the money. Uh, that that's going on. And so, though, I mean, I have a number of other issues that we're that we're that we're Let, dealing let's with. Let's move in our last twelve minutes or so. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the sportsmen's legislative sportsmen's caucus that you uh, just joined, and and let me preface that by saying uh, it, some of the information that you shared with me, the mission of the Oregon Legislative Sportsmen's Caucus is to preserve and promote the traditional rights of Oregon citizens to hunt, fish, and pursue outdoor activities, to ensure that Oregon sportsmen and women have reasonable access to public lands to enjoy outdoor pursuits, to support efforts to enhance multiple-use habitat management for wildlife and fishery, and Uh, to recognize the importance of hunting, fishing, and other outdoor activities to our nation's economy and support maintenance and growth of outdoor-related industries and activities. So those are some pretty good bullets there, if I might (laughs) That's a bad pun. That was a bad pun. But, (laughs) But, uh, you know, uh, it sounds like something I could get behind. I I, I thought you would. It is a, you know, I uh, grew up at different times hunting and fishing. Uh, with with relatives and friends and uh, and and teams of folks, you know, it's a, either with a with a group of Boy Scouts or other other groups. Uh, and and my my grandfather was a fisher, uh, loved to fish mm-hmm. as well, and all sorts of other folks fished and uh, we did a lot of fishing. Um, so I felt very comfortable mm-hmm. um, talking with folks about how this is handled. We need to make sure that we have the the resources and the 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 conservation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so associated with that. So it's a balance. Yeah. And one of the other issues that we have, quite frankly, is that a lot of folks no longer hunt and fish mm-hmm. for food because uh, they, don't, they don't have to. Right. Uh, and so there are fewer people on my, on my block. When I first moved into my, my house in 77, there were at least four families that left uh, on a regular basis to go hunting. They'd go elk hunting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they'd come back and that, would, that food, that elk would be put into the, into the freezers and that's one of the major sources of their food for that, that winter. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that is no longer as much the case. Mm-hmm. In fact, I don't think I have anybody on my block right now who hunts. Oh, hunts. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's not uncommon to see that as, a, as an issue. So we've had some significant changes for Oregon over the years. Well, and, how, and how do we support that and, um, and, 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 and bring people to understand that they can do some things? It's, I think it's a real different Well, I different think we approach. need to bring to the understanding this whole hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> well, there's that. There's that. Good, clean fun out there, as well as, as yeah. harvesting some game, some big game fish and those kinds of things. Of these uh, uh, bullets on your mission statement, the one that's near and dear to my heart is ensure reasonable access right. because across the country, Oregon is no different. People are buying up the properties and not in, allowing people to to, uh, to have fishing and hunting rights on on properties at a, at a very rapid rate. Right. So uh, well, I that's think it's important that we sub- support the the access. That's why I see some of the bills that that you've got going where uh, that are that are being considered where fish and wildlife or uh, forestry, for example, would, uh, if they're doing closing of any lands, they would have to notify the legislature first and that kind of stuff. Those are, those are good ideas good. to good ensure year. access because as we try to get more inner city people to consider hunting, shooting, and fishing and all these kinds of recreational things in the outdoors, yeah. uh, we need to have the places for them to be able to, to go. Do that. Uh, I know I rolled up on a, one of my spots in where we used to fish in Woodson the other day, and big sign there about some private wildlife area. Boom, 
I, I, private I, wildlife mm -hmm. area now. Yeah, and and I had been uh, pulling my little boat off of that road fishing since I was like five years old. Hmm. I mean, you know, so that's that's what well. can possibly happen if we're not uh, very vigilant. And let me ask you, and related to the sportsmen's caucus or not not specific, specifically sportsmen's caucus, but there there was. Uh, Budget bills for fish and wildlife, and we're going to talk about these more in future shows. And then there's also gun bills as well right. that uh, relate to sportsmen's, uh, you know, possession of guns and things right. like that. But there, there were some unusual bills that I saw. That it was a companion bill in the House and the Senate that would allow uh, retired police officers to carry guns in public buildings and stuff without going through security check or people that have. Uh, uh, concealed weapons permits to to not have to go through checks or give up their guns and all this kind of stuff. No, this is part of the uh, the whole discussion about uh, guns and um, and the approach that we've we've taken in this country to to that. You know, we didn't we we had a sort of a common sense approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess when I was growing up, mm -hmm. I call it a common sense approach. Mm -hmm. um, you what there, there was not an expectation that anyone would be carrying a gun mm -hmm. uh, or in, in places like that. Uh, we now have, um, I think, a real different um, approach, and that's been carefully crafted, mm -hmm. uh, in my view, by, by some folks in uh, the gun, gun industry in particular, but um, not, not necessarily to the safety of the, of the community. Right. right. Uh, it's, it's set up uh, in, a, in a way that's, uh, I think, very poorly done, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a, that's a concern of mine. I don't know how far those bills are going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of the part of the process that we started the discussion on. Um, well, I haven't had a lot of time to think about it, but immediately some questions popped up in my mind. If we if we have statistics like we had in Ferguson, yeah, where the police officers were treating people disparately, and that's happening as we see across the country, and you're right. talking about it through your bills here mm -hmm. in Oregon. And so now these people are retired, and you want to give them extra kind of permission to carry guns in public places. And that, why would we do that? You know, I mean, that's a question that I have. I, you know, others, you know, maybe people got some answers for me. Well, there, I'm sure that there are some bills, answers but. there. I mean, folks are going to say that those are the folks who should know how to uh, to handle weapons. And if and if and 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 that's and they because they've been trained for a while, uh, and that's that's very likely true. I think there's a, a question then on um, on how they how you might how you might um, evaluate whether their what, what their status is in a particular way. Another bill that I saw was a bill that would take the uh, fish and wildlife unit of state police. And put it under Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Have you seen that one? I have seen that one, but I'm not sure whether that's going to go anywhere at this okay. particular point. Right. So, um, I mean, it, to me, it wouldn't make any difference except if you have a general emergency and the person is a state police officer, then maybe those other duties would take precedent over going and giving somebody a, ta a ticket for it. Right. A right, game violation, right, right. you know and, what I'm saying? We've, we've seen yeah. that kind of a balance take place. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we saw it take place with when when the Portland police, when the Portland schools police moved over to become Portland police. Right. And and what and who was going to have priority mm -hmm. on on in an issue and attitude took mm -hmm. place. Now the Portland schools police are have worked through that a great deal, mm -hmm. but initially we had some we had some tension. We had some some issues. And, you know, how important are, are are you approaching the kids as though that all the kids are criminals, mm -hmm. or are you approaching the kids as though they're you know, this is a community policing aspect? Mm -hmm. Those were the, some of the issues that we had initially, and mm -hmm. we we worked through some of them, but it still was a, a struggle at times. Uh, so, and so that that can be a concern. I haven't. I'll have to look at that bill. I haven't seen that particular one that well. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Yeah, but uh, yeah, there are a number of of bills like that 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 have been proposed. Uh, and then some of these constitutional rights to hunt and fish, and just reinforcing the uh, a citizen's right to hunt and fish. Well, Although and, I, I don't and, think these might 
anybody pressing to take those right. away. That's exactly the point. Yeah. I, I don't see anyone pressing to take those away. Although, I, as, I, as I always say, there's a, there's a real difference when somebody walks by an elementary school in Burns, Oregon, carrying a rifle, mm -hmm. and somebody walks by an elementary school in my neighborhood carrying a rifle. Right. Because in, in Burns, you know that they're probably going hunting for deer or or duck or something, right. and in 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 my my neighborhood, it, who are they hunting? Who are they going after? Mm -hmm. That's 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 the problem. So we don't have that kind. We we have to recognize those kinds of differences, right? And and uh, and adjust as a result of that. Right. Right. Uh, final thoughts in our last couple of minutes, oh. Lou, that uh, you might share with us. How can we get get involved as citizens with the legislature, with you or your colleagues? What, what, how would we be most influential in, in terms of bringing an issue to you? Well, I always, I sort of jokingly say that my other office ends up being Safeway, Fred Meyer, or New Seasons because mm -hmm. I end up having people talk with me on a regular basis. But really, um, going, every legislator I know has a town hall mm -hmm. uh, once a month. I, mine, mine is basically a coffee, a chat with Lou, the mm -hmm. second Saturday of every month, at the 17th and Broadway, okay. uh, the Broadway Grill. It's okay. at 9 o'clock in the morning. Second Saturday of every month, 9 o'clock, Broadway Grill, 17th and Broadway. Okay. Uh, if people would like to come up and talk with me about things, we have about an hour, hour, and, hour and a half there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we also have, but you also need to go down to Salem. Mm -hmm. If you get a chance, if you have a chance, you should go to your state capitol. It is your capitol. And you should try to find a way to, to get people there because they don't see a lot of folks necessarily mm -hmm. except on special days. Mm -hmm. But find a way to not just go and stand around the rotunda, but go and listen in on the committee meetings mm -hmm. and hear what people are saying. And that makes a big difference. If you're there, if you're seen, if you've if you cr created a relationship, it makes a huge difference. And then finally, yes, you can write, mm -hmm. but don't use one of the form letter kinds of things. Right. Just Write something individually, an email, or, or a written thing helps a whole lot because people then get a sense well, of what I you're talking about. I found it very easy to contact you with the websites and everything mm -hmm. that are available now. And uh, that's good. There's no, it's, it's very easy to contact any of your legislators right now. So we do get overwhelmed. So recognize let me close that. by uh, just thanking Bruce again for the opportunity to host uh, Oregon Voters Digest will be aired again twice this week on channels 22 and 23 and we hope that if you didn't get a chance to tune in today you'll tell you someone will tell you about that or you tune in at another time uh, and I'm going to be back on the second Sunday of each month for a while so Donnie Adair saying see you then thank you